Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia.
A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Galeed, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And these brothers agreed, when some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. 
Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. 
When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The Word of the Lord. Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Day by day we bless you, Lord, keep us from all sin today. Lord, show us your love and mercy. In you, Lord, is our hope. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessings through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart and especially the hearts of the people of this land that barriers which divide us may crumble suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Be ever present, O Lord, with those who are suffering from the coronavirus. Strengthen all who are on the medical front lines against COVID-19. Enable those in authority to make good and timely decisions about matters related, related to the virus. Help us all to do what we can to slow the spread of the disease. Empower the church to be the church in creative, calm, and compassionate ways and bring this pandemic to a swift end so that lives are spared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your beloved Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love, 
in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Praying together the prayer of St. John Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised to your well beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. have those who are watching at home with us as well. Call your attention once again to the announcement about our outreach program. It's on page 18 there in the service leaflet. We will be restarting our homeless lunch program tomorrow morning after it being gone to First Presbyterian for the last five months and now it's returning to St. Andrews. So we're in need of volunteers to help out with that. Just one hour a week would be great. Uh, it would be 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. Pick a day, uh, choose one and help us out. That would be a great, great benefit to St. Andrews. And see Sue McIsaac, our chair of our outreach committee, if you can help. So Sue, you want to raise your hand there? There you go. Here's Sue. Okay. Thanks very much. Subscribe to the Lord, the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Time travel movies are entertaining and a bit mind-bending. They ask the question of what would happen if you could go back in time and change history. Back to the Future tells the story of Marty McFly escaping to 1955 in a car-shaped time machine and entering the world of his parents when they were teenagers. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry and Hermione use a time-turner to try to save Hogwarts. More recently, the superheroes of Avengers Endgame use time travel to save the universe from a big purple monster man. Time travel movies. They raise an intriguing question. If you could go back in time and change one thing, what would it be? The Atlantic Magazine recently asked this question of some university professors. Duke professor Sandy Darity says, I wish that radical reconstruction had been made a reality after the end of the Civil War. If this had happened, former slaves would have enjoyed full political participation, along with control over the schooling of their children, protection by the Union Army, and land grants of 40 acres for farming. Rutgers professor Samantha Kelly has a suggestion that might surprise you. She wishes that agriculture had never been invented. Yes, agriculture. There would be far less environmental degradation and income inequality, she says. A world without industrial agriculture would pretty much be the Eden of the Bible. Professor Kelly wants to go back in time, way back in time, to the Garden of Eden. How about you? What change would you make? Would you prevent the assassination of Lincoln? Overthrow Hitler before the Second World War? Save Jesus from the agony of the cross? In the book of Genesis, a man named Jacob settled in the land of Canaan. He had 12 sons, and one of them was named Joseph. Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his children, says Genesis, because he was the son of his old age. And Jacob made him a long robe with sleeves, sometimes called a coat of many colors. Now, you can just imagine how his brothers responded to all this. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, in addition, Joseph was a dreamer. And one of his dreams contained the message that all of his brothers would bow down to him. When they heard this, they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. If you could go back in time and change history, you might say to Jacob the father, hey, don't play favorites with Joseph. All his brothers hate him. At age 17, Joseph was shepherding the flock with his brothers, acting as a helper. Four of them were misbehaving in the field, and so Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Joseph ratted out Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher threw them all under the bus. If you could travel back in time, you might say to Joseph, hey, don't be a snitch. Your brothers are going to terminate you. Well, sure enough, the situation went from bad to worse when Joseph was sent to check on his brothers as they pastured their father's flock. And so Joseph went after them and found them at a place called Dothan. No, not the one in Alabama. 
And his brothers saw him from a distance. And before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. One rather clever definition of the word siblings is this. People you either plan to murder or plan a murder with. There's no middle ground. And so the brothers said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now. Let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. If you could employ a Harry Potter time-turner, you might say to the brothers, don't do it. You'll never get away with murder. Well, fortunately, the eldest brother, Reuben, talked some sense into his younger siblings. Let us not take his life, he said. Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on it. That's because Reuben's plan was to rescue Joseph later and then return him to their father. Give the elder brother some credit. He made a good decision. Right in the middle of this tragic tale of favoritism, hatred, snitching, and bloodlust. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe and threw him in an empty pit. Feeling hungry after all their exertions, they sat down to eat. But as they were eating, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, carrying precious cargo to Egypt. Between bites, middle brother Judah said to his siblings, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And all the brothers agreed. And so they drew Joseph up and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And the traveling traders took Joseph down to Egypt. If you could be an avenger and do some time travel, you might say to the brothers, glad you didn't kill him. But selling him into slavery? Is that a good end game? The story of Joseph and his brothers makes us want to go back in time and make some changes. Why not? Most of us can think of positive choices that would have changed history and improved the world. Saving Lincoln from assassination. Supporting Reconstruction after the Civil War. Both would have been good for God's people in some terribly tumultuous times. But we should never forget that God is always working toward a surprising conclusion, even when humans are acting in horrible ways. In the book of Genesis, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. That's bad. But Joseph found favor in Potiphar's sight and was put in charge of his house. That's good. Then Potiphar's wife saw how handsome Joseph was, and she said, lie with me. That's bad. But Joseph refused. That's good. Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of misconduct, and he was thrown into prison. That's bad. Then God showed him love and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. That's good. Bad, good, bad, good, bad, good. Clearly, God is always working toward a surprising conclusion, even when humans are misbehaving. If we were to go back in time and change history, we might disrupt the work that God is doing in the world. 
While in prison, Joseph became an interpreter of dreams, and eventually he offered insight into the dreams of Pharaoh. He was released from prison and rose to power in Egypt, becoming second in command to the Pharaoh himself. Eventually, famine struck the entire region, and people from many, many countries came to buy bread in Egypt. And among those hungry people were Joseph's brothers. Now at first, Joseph did not reveal his identity to them, and he treated them harshly. But eventually, he agreed to help them, and he said, Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people. And at the end of the story, Joseph forgave his brothers and provided for them, just as God had wanted him to do. In every time and place and situation, God is working his purpose out. Sometimes we humans cooperate with that purpose, and sometimes we don't. But nothing deters God in the work of saving people from destruction. Even the bad things that we would like to change in world history and in our own personal histories can be transformed into good. God is not responsible for the evil that people do. But history shows us that God can turn bad into good. God did it with Joseph and his brothers. God did it with Jesus on the cross. God did it with Paul, who moved from a persecutor of the church to an apostle to the Gentiles. You see, nothing is wasted with God. When Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, they set the stage for his rise in Egypt. When Jesus died and was buried, he was put in the right place for resurrection. And the zeal of Saul, the persecutor, changed into the passion of Paul, the apostle. Each of us has committed sins, suffered defeats, made mistakes, and been treated shabbily. We might want to jump in a time machine and change the past. But remember, God is always at work in our lives, turning evil into good. Since nothing is wasted with God, there is no point in trying to change history. Instead, trust God to transform your future.
Please kneel for the blessing. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.